Sökte sinnet stille haven, stranden, kystet, fredens sted Jeg lot min far kost drive av mot drømte selskapsørs fred Men mer uro, mer vind og storm og større sjø enn der Og mindre ro i sjel og sinn og mer vankelmod i vær En just på det hette stille hav har aldri på mitt livs atlant Hvor før får lys og bunnløs grav så mange unge drømmer falt Og store stille ocean, jeg priser dag din bølge sant Ditt hav og himmel lyster an til en som skal få lyse av Som selv på vannet går Og stille stormen med et ord Og roper frels oss vi forgår Et ensomt sinn har ingen strand Og ingen frelser ingenting Foruten dødens himmelrand Og evighetens hav omkring en sol blir kastet som en sten i havet her hver dag, hvert år. Og mørken etter en og en som ring om ring om landet går. Jeg kjenner snart det stille havet og han som stiller stormen der. For det er meg som stiller av og ikke storm og hav. And uh, to those uh, participating uh, digitally, um, we're the band, and uh, we're today's entertainment. Uh, I would say um, we're called Purban, and uh, you will hear, hear more from us uh, during the course of the seminar. Now I'd like to give the stage to uh, um, board leader, chair of Habitat Norway, Erik Berg. Thank you. Thank you, Erik. Uh, and thank you to your band, which translated from Norwegian. Pöbel in English means the mob. <laughs> Dear colleagues and friends, welcome to all and sundry 
to this Urban Thinkers campus here in Oslo. My name is Erik Berg. I'm the chairman of Habitat uh, Norway, the organizer of this event with UN Habitat's World Urban uh, Campaign as co-organizer. It's a great pleasure indeed to welcome speakers and participants from all continents to the first Urban Thinkers Campus in uh, Norway. This conference is held in the facilities of the Norwegian Polytechnical Association. And we are very grateful uh, to them for their support and their uh, cooperation. We are very pleased this afternoon to have uh, with us the uh, UN Under Secretary General and Executive Director of UN Habitat, Mrs. Waimuna Mood uh, Sharif. Regrettably, because of some uh, technical uh, problems, uh, her intervention uh, has been moved to the pause at 16.05. Uh, Nevertheless, we know that today's theme is of high interest and relevance to uh, the executive director. As former mayor of Penang, Malaysia, she in 2008 initiated, established, and managed the Georgetown World Heritage Site. I would also like to thank the World Urban Campaign Secretariat, Christine Auclair, Flossie Amviri, and Damien Thibault, who I know is with us for their uh, assistance in preparing uh, this uh, webinar. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is also a great honor to address you in this unique historic building dating back to the first half of the 19th century. The building is a reminiscence of an Italian Renaissance building situated in the very center of Oslo city. Its external colors and decorations with an interior brimming of art, for me, mirrors a major challenge. How could architecture promote multicultural understanding with more tolerance and respect? This place, in my mind, reflects, creates, and recreates identity and belonging not only for the inhabitants of Oslo, but also for visitors from a wider uh, global uh, community. It offers, in fact, resistance to historic amnesia. It makes you feel good. It reminds us that for the future, we need more space for more human uh, worth. The present urban context that we live in is part of a neoliberal world, dominated by what the sociologist Saskia Sassen has termed an all-you-can-eat mentality, privatizing gains and socializing losses. In the development of our cities, this trend reflects a move away from a system of small properties embedded in city areas crisscrossed by streets and small public squares. The trend today is towards mega projects with sometimes huge footprints also on uh, the climate. Footprints that erase much of the public tissue of people, streets and squares. It privatizes and dehumanizes city space, no matter the added uh, density. It forces people out of areas where they have been living for years. It destroys the economic activities upon which ordinary people base their lives. 
and it reduces opportunities for a decent future for our children. All factors decisive for identity and the sense of uh, belonging. A huge part of our identity comes from the identity of place. Stereotype sterile places in the form of closed, gated communities for the so-called alpha elites are now replacing mixed communities, forcing average income earners out. Anna Minton, in her book, Who is London For?, even asks the question, is the struggle for space no replacing the class struggle? With these few words, I thank you for your uh, attention. And I'm honored to give uh, the floor to, the, to uh, today's chairwoman, Kersti Grut. Please, thank you. Thank you, Eric Berg. I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this uh, seminar. Either you follow the seminar on the YouTube streaming or here in Rosenkranzgate 7 in Oslo. Uh, I've been told that we are about 200 persons on the YouTube channel, so I hope we will see. Hopefully we'll have a lot of input from there. Um, <clears throat> This seminar is uh, hosted by Habitat Norway in cooperation with Urban Thinkers Campus and World Urban Campaign together with Polytechnic Associations, where we are now. I am Kjersti Grut and I'm going to try to guide you through this seminar. Before we go ahead with the program, I will say two words about the organization that is uh, Habitat Norway. It is a voluntary non-profit advocacy and information association promoting social sustainability and poverty eradication. Our membership base is uh, mainly of students and academics, urban planners, architects, uh, geographers, economics, etc. And if you want to involve uh, with us in these topics that we are talking about today or support us, you can also become a member. All necessary information for becoming a member is available on our webpage. In this seminar, we hope to present some new perspectives on place and architecture um, <clears throat> uh, as a collective art and in this way inspire how we think about sustainable urban development. In particular, we would like to your input on what will become Habitat Norway's comment on the Norwegian government national plan on sustainable development to be prepared this autumn. Few words about the program and the necessary steps to protect ourselves against the COVID-19. Uh, I start with the end and how we will get there safely. To close this seminar um, in an active mode, we invite you to participate in finalizing the conclusion on what we call the 10 points of action. Um, a draft is made available for all, all of you in, on our Facebook and web pages. And we will also invite all of the speakers to share what they think is the mo one single most important action point to follow up uh, as a comment to these 10 points. We will also like to have your uh, opinion and um, I will tell you how you can uh, share these opin opinions and comments with us in a second. Uh, building up to this closure, um, you will have the pleasure to listen to six exciting lectures in the uh, coming three hours. I will present the speakers um, as we go along. And there will be some Q uh, questions and an answers, short sessions of questions and answers in between. If you have any comments, questions along the way, uh, <clears throat> either here in Rosenkranzgate 7 or on uh, the YouTube uh, streaming, uh, please make sure to send a comment on the YouTube link or on the Facebook event or on email to uh, habitatnorway at gmail.com. 
Johannes Fjuseberg, who is not sitting next to me, but over there, <coughs> also a board member of Habitat Norway, will uh, monitor all the messages and make some choices and read some of them loud when appropriate. Um, <clears throat> we are all very much aware of the need to protect ourselves, as I said, from COVID-19. So we will make sure to clean the mix in the mix microphones between the speakers. So please use that time to think about good comments and good questions to pose. Some security information for those of you who are in Rosenkranzgata. In case of emergency, please follow the green lights down into the streets. And whatever you do, please remember that one meter is about this uh, long. So keep the one meter physical distance and use the anti-back bottles that are around in this room. So now we are ready to <laughs> proceed. Are we? Yes. We are going directly as, uh, yeah. Our next speaker is Gro Lauland. Prepare. She's an architect from the Oslo School of Architecture. Presently, she's practicing architect parallel with teaching as associate uh, professor at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, NTNU in Trondheim. Research interests include architectural philosophy and aesthetics, and uh, she has written a, a PhD on Christian Norbert Schultz's theory of place. Presently, she's launching a book on this thinking. So please, Gru Laulan, uh, the floor is yours. And she is also a member of the Habitat Norway board. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for having me here. Uh, my uh, talk is named The Challenge, Architecture versus Mer Mer Building. UN Sustainability Goal number 11.4 is as follows. Strengthen efforts to protect and safeguard the world's cultural and natural heritage. This is also central in the work of Habitat Norway, which focuses on the cities and the urbanization that is taking place today. The cities of the world are growing at the same time as cities and places are becoming more and more similar. Historic buildings are being demolished and poor people are being displaced, like Eric was talking about, from the historic city centers. My participation in Habitat Norway has its background in my profession as an architect and urbanist, and this seminar has such an anchor. The seminar is based on an architectural critique that also involves a critique of contemporary society and modernity. I would like to start with an example, perhaps well known to many here, to try to clarify which understanding is central to the field of architecture and an architectural practice. In 1996, the French architectural firm Lacaton et Vassal was asked to make a proposal for a new design of Place Léon au Coq, a small triangular square in Bordeaux in France. As part of the new mayor's desire for a beautification of the city, but after studying the place, the office concluded that no new design was needed. Instead, they decided a few maintenance tasks, replacing the gravel, cleaning more often, and trimming the lime trees. Any form of beautification is unnecessary here, they argued, because the place already has fine qualities, charm, and life. The project is typical of Lacaton et Vassal's work as architects. The decision not to change anything is not a denial of the importance of architecture. It is simply a different approach to the role of the architect. Being an architect does not just mean building, as Lacaton et Vassal sees it. Quote, 
the first to do is to think. And only after that are you able to say whether you should build or not. This is says Anne Lockato in an interview in 2003. I would add that in addition to thinking, you also have to see and sense the place to be able to talk about its qualities. And you can only do that by being there, grasping the atmosphere of the place. Lacaton et Vassal's approach, which involves taking a step back rather than putting their own action first, challenges a market economy approach where the intention is to achieve the greatest possible profit. Thus, their architectural practice can be said to be challenging the consumer culture of our time. Architecture, together with poetry, once resisted our forgetfulness. But this is rarely the case anymore, neither in Norway nor in the rest of the world. Today, the global building industry seems to have lost sight of the importance of place, of the concrete, qualitative and sensational characteristics of the physical rooms we are all embedded in. According to the Norwegian architect and thinker Christian Nova-Schulz, losing the sense of quality means losing touch with what is with reality. We cannot dwell on the grief of this loss, but the understanding of which kind of mindset that is needed as a basis for action if we are to achieve the UN sustainability goals for settlement and building can, in my view, shed light on sustainability goal number 13, take urgent action to combat climate changes and its impact. So then, how can we challenge the way we develop our cities? Doesn't sustainable solutions to the housing and climate crisis call for a change of mindset? A different way of thinking than that which, among other things, has led to reduced biological diversity and to the degradation of cities and countries today. Albert Einstein's insight was that no problem can be solved from the same consciousness that created it. In my work as an associate professor in Trondheim, I ask myself, how is it possible to make up for the lost understanding of place in the architectural education and in society in general? In this seminar, we would like to emphasize the importance of the UN sustainability goals. And at the same time, we want to clarify it by the importance of the qualities in what has been given to us, both in nature and throughout history. In nature, every spot of land is different. Natural, natural light is different from place to place. And the same goes for the topography, the vegetation and the climate conditions. Over the centuries leading up to World War II, Architecture has largely played along with the given nature. We are still surrounded by buildings that were built to last, yes, even for eternity, like this one. And they tell us about a different way of seeing the world than the one that is dominant, dominant in our time. Since the time of Vitruvius, architectural quality has been associated with the unity of beauty, usability and durability, it unites aesthetics and ethics. Architecture belongs to the arts and as an art form, architecture resists the consumer culture. It is by virtue of its architectural quality related to durability. Buildings can be said to be more or less sustainable
Our understanding of the world is manifested in what we make and produce. And if we are to achieve a different building practice than the one that prevails today, we must, as I said initially, challenge the mindset that characterizes the building production of our time. The political thinker Hannah Arendt argues that reality is not a result of our own creative power. And she warns again against human arrogance. In extension of such an understanding, she emphasizes that cognition and thought are not the same. In the book, The Human Condition from 1958, she writes that, quote, the chief manifestation of the cogni cognitive process by which we acquire and store up knowledge is the sciences. Cognition always pursues a definite aim, which can be set by practical considerations as well by, as by idle curiosity. But once this aim is reached, the cognitive process has come to an end. And this way, I see it. This is, this, uh, the way I see it, this is the mindset that, together with greed, characterizes much of the building market today. Thought, which has its origin in wonder, on the contrary, aren't right, is the source of artworks, and it manifests itself without transformation and transfiguration in all great philosophy going back hundreds and hundreds of years. Thought, she says, has neither an end, neither an end nor an aim outside itself. It does not even produce results. And she continues, not only the utilitarian philosophy, but the man of action and the lovers of results have never tired of point, pointing out how entirely useless thought is. As useless, Indeed, as the work of art, it inspires. By emphasizing the difference between cognition and thought, art helps to clarify, clarify that there are limits to human actions, limits we have to respect if we are not to face our own downfall. The way art sees, sees it, Modern man who places cognition higher than thought is characterized by arrogance, hubris. Both in relation to nature and to the world. We want to remake everything and detest the idea that something is simply given and not reversible, she claims. But, says, says Arendt, we are dependent on taking care of a vulnerable and sensible nature of which we, are, we ourselves are a part. And we are also dependent on a world we ourselves have created, a world which can outlive us. Our Arendt's main concern is ethical, philosophical. It is not primarily aesthetic aesthetics that is her field. As part of the field of architecture, we can talk about related to thought, the way Arendt uses the term, what the Norwegian architect and thinker Christian Oberschulz describes as a poetical mm -hmm. understanding. An understanding that also emphasizes the given basis for our production and our creative activities. Our building activities cannot be understood detached from a concrete, physical and spatial context, context where all the different room sizes are connected from continents, countries, regions, settlements, cities, squares, streets, streets and buildings and different kinds of inter interiors. Our own body is in the world as the heart is in the organism, says Merleau-Ponty. In other words, the architecture and buildings speak directly to us, to our bodies and senses, not like singular objects, 
but as part of a place and of places that are interconnected. Through the texts Nuba Schulz wrote in the last 20 years of his life, he shows that the pre prerequisite of the work of architecture is this careful listening to what is given us in nature and through history, and that such responsiveness is not first and foremost associated with concepts and words. The example from the place in Bordeaux indicates a responsiveness, the same poetical understanding that Nuba Schulz talks about in his phenomenology of place. So now I will try to sum up here. The changes in our way of building, and especially in the housing market is re in recent decades, have a direct impact on the understanding and practice of the architectural profession and on our lives. The desire for profit has become decisive for the blasting of nature and landscapes, for building of large residential and holiday home areas, for the design of new instrumentally planned buildings, often meant to be, re be replaced after one generation and for the demolishing of historical buildings in urban areas. The role of the architect has changed. And in, teaching of in the teaching of young architects, it is necessary to ask the basic questions once again. What is architecture? What is the significant significance of architecture and the architectural work? So I see it. The, form, the foremost task of architecture is to enable people to experience belonging, to feel at home. The English architect Daniel Rossbottom says, architecture is a collective art. It is made for the citizen. Architects have responsibilities beyond themselves to people, the urban realm, history and the future. Buildings should be good neighbors and good houses. He's one of the architects be uh, behind the, the concert building and library in Bude. A discussion of what characterizes the architectural work may lead to a clarification of how architects and the architectural profession should relate to sustainability goals. Perhaps the question of what separates architecture from what can be described as mere building can also lead to a deeper understanding of how the authorities can meet inhabitants and especially children and young people when they demand for another care for both nature and future generations. This is the discussion we want to open up for both in this seminar and through this new book, Fellowskapets Architektur, Opprør, where Daniel Rossbottom and also Alfredo Brillenburg, who will talk later today, are among the contributors. This is the book. Thank you very much, uh, Gro. Um, we will now proceed um, to another presentation from um, Anna Victoria von Svag and uh, Tora Volset, and they will talk about the Hellesylt project, New Stories. Um, they are both architects, uh, having graduated from NTNU in Trondheim in uh, 2019. Uh, they made a common diploma project investigating placemaking in a small community in Western Norway. Anna is present, presently practicing for Rodeo Architects and uh, Tone for Grape, Grape Architects in Oslo. Uh, after the presentation, there will be a Q&A for, for your presentation and for Gro. So please come up. The floor is yours. Ja. 
Hello. Uh, as mentioned, we are Emma and Tura, and um, we're going to present our diploma project that we delivered uh, last spring at Antenu in Tournai. Uh, and our project uh, revolves around uh, the small town of Hedlesylt, uh, where we wanted to investigate uh, if uh, our alternative ways of developing uh, this place and what does actually development mean uh, in a small place like this. Uh, and this is our starting point. Uh, this is Volset, where my name comes from, and also where my great-grandfather was born. Um, uh, I've spent all of my summers uh, in this house that's located 12 kilometers from Hellesylt, um, which means that my whole life I've had a relationship to Hellesylt as um, uh, a place uh, where we hike in the mountains and um, sort of uh, this summer, um, my summer paradise. Um, but then through this project, we started actually looking into what this, uh, what it means to live uh, in Hellesylt uh, and uh, um, yeah, what's actually happening there now. Uh, so Hellesil is uh, situated here in Møre Romsdal on the northwest coast of Norway, about an eight-hour drive from Oslo. And um, it's situated in a pretty dramatic uh, postcard-friendly landscape uh, in the other end of the Geirangir fjord. So you can see Geirangir is over here and Hellesil is um, in this part here. And the landscape also shapes um, or gives a frame to this compact city centre, which is situated on this flat uh, piece of land, only a couple of metres above the sea level, with this uh, sort of back um, uh, hill um, closing it to, or closing in around it. Um, so this is the city centre of Helsinki. Um, we quickly sort of uh, saw two main qualities. Um, one is obviously the, the surrounding nature. Um, this is also what every single uh, local person will point out as the sort of main quality with Hellesylt, its, its surroundings. Um, and it's also got a, a sit, uh, town centre um, where a large part of that is these um, small-scale wooden houses that are um, situated quite um, uh, densely. Um, so that gives it a sort of urban, something urban in this very rural place. Um, here we have made a diagram to show the development of Hellesylt over the past 80 years. Um, as you can see, uh, before the war, um, these sort of dense wooden houses was what the place was made out of. And then after the 70s, um, industrial buildings started popping up and they've sort of just grown and grown and kept growing. And you can't see it that well, but the grey part signifies how the land uh, has also been filled out into the fjord. Um, with the latest extension uh, being the cruise harbour uh, which was added a couple of years ago. That's uh, created a sort of uh, problem uh, in terms of the legibility of, uh, of the place. When you come to Hellesylt as a tourist for the first time, it's sort of unclear, like, have I arrived? Where do I go? Uh, where are the toilets? Um, and the petrol station kind of stands out as the, as the main... Uh, spots in a way. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, and there's uh, one thing that makes uh, the situation in Hellesylt extra complex, uh, I would say, um, and that is, uh, as we've said, you have Hellesylt here and then uh, up a bit up north in the fjord you have Åkenese. Uh, which is a uh, part of uh, the mountain that's leaning uh, into the fjord and there's movement in this 
this part and uh, geologists uh, say that this quite big part of the mountain might slide into the fjord one day. If that happens, uh, it could potentially cause a tsunami uh, in Hellesylt uh, that would be almost 80 meters tall, uh, which as we've seen, Hellesylt is a quite flat, small uh, place. So that would basically mean that uh, all of the infrastructure in Hellesylt will, would be lost. Because of this, there are um, obviously very big safety measures put in place. Um, and uh, so today they say that everyone will be notified in good time in the event of a, a tsunami. Um, uh, so you will have plenty of time for people to get out, uh, but ev all physical infrastructure will, will probably be lost. Uh, this has created uh, quite complex regulations uh, and it's uh, in Hellesylt it's perceived as very hard to make something happen. Um, the inhabitants uh, want to stay. Um, uh, when we've been there, the discussion there is a lot of people are saying things like you could get hit by a bus, there could be a tsunami, but we, right now we want to live our lives. Um, and that is understandable and I, uh, our perspective is that we need to also respect, uh, respect that. Um, yeah. And uh, of course there's also made <laughs> uh, the Norwegian movie Bølgen, uh, that has sort of animated this uh, wave and how it might look. Um, but the pro proximity to the fjord also uh, attracts uh, very big amounts of tourists. Um, in 20, the summer of 2018, there was approximately 400,000 cruise tourists that came by Hellesylt. Um, and uh, there's also uh, lots of people coming, coming by car. Um, but, uh, and as you can see, there's, a, um, there's something about the scale here. Uh, when a cruise ship arrives in Hellesylt, uh, it feels like, or it is almost the size of the place. Um, and there's uh, more people on that boat than in the whole, whole of Hellesylt. Um, uh, even if they have all these tourists, they don't uh, really leave much uh, money or, uh, or they rarely stay for a long time. Um, as the situation is now, Hellesylt has, uh, or at least last year, it has little to none activities for tourists. Uh, there is virtually no place to stay, um, and it's it can be challenging to find a place to eat. Uh, to illustrate this, this is a screen grab from Airbnb in January 2019, and you can see there's yeah, two rooms that you can rent. Um, and uh, but the tourism has long roots in Helsinki. Um, this is uh, the Grand Hotel, um, which was built in uh, 19 or the early part of the 1900s, um, when tourists started coming to the western part uh, of Norway, both from England and from Norway and from yeah, uh, Central Europe. Um, but it wasn't actually built then, it was moved from uh, the other part of Hellesylt, two wooden hotels were moved out here uh, and put together uh, because uh, the most important thing was to be as close as possible to the, um, to the pier so that you were the first uh, house that the tourists met when they came. So you can see here the, the pier and the, the hotel. Um, and um, Grand Hotel uh, is still in Hellesylt today, uh, but there's, uh, it hasn't been run as a hotel for many, many years. Um, and 
through several fail failed attempts of starting up um, a hotel here again. Uh, it has become a symbol for the people of Hellesylt uh, of how challenging it is to make something work uh, here. And it even went uh, so far as, I think this is in yeah, the beginning of 2018, uh, where uh, the hotel was, the owners tried to give it away for free. Um, yeah. Um, so with this image um, is kind of where our interest uh, in Hellesylt really ignited. Um, the owners of this plot with uh, Grand Hotel um, hired architecture company Snöta, um, who made a sketch of this uh, uh, long wooden structure in the in the plot of Grand Hotel. Uh, the hotel today is like out on the on the tip of that, but they yeah, stretch it out to cross also the main car connection to the to the ferry crossing. Um, yeah, there we have it in the plan. And um, the, the project provided some, some nice sketches. Um, the idea of the hotel is to be a sort of a base camp hotel. It's like a new uh, hotel concept for like uh, extreme sport, uh, sort of young tourists. Um, and the image is nice, but we, uh, we experienced that it doesn't really uh, show how this hotel is situated in a sort of urban context or like semi-urban context <laughs> at least. It's, it looks like you're on the top of a mountain and sleeping under the stars. And uh, this slide is taken from Snöta's own presentation of the project, um, which shows that the uh, concept of the project is this uh, Sami Lavo. Um, which is then repeated into this uh, long structure. Um, and we, we reacted as it felt a bit sort of alienated. Um, what does the Sami Lavo have to do with the coast of uh, Sunmere? Um, and uh, asked ourselves, is there a way we can uh, make architecture with, um, with the sort of springing out from the existing context and uh, not out of a sort of idea? Um, what all of these illustrations of Hellesylt have in common uh, from the from the Snata project is that they don't show uh, the the. Will you do the next slide? <laughs> <laughs> this part of Hellesylt, which is the actual um, place, um, we felt like they sort of yeah tried to focus on the nature as mentioned before and sort of turned their, uh, back to the to the existing situation. Um, so with that, we, we started our project um, doing as much research as possible uh, on uh, what is uh, on this other side of the river in Hellesylt. Um, we started out in January, as you can see, the images are pretty uh, blue and cold. Um, so just sort of taking in as much information as possible, we made a uh, pop-up architecture office in the city, uh, in the city, in the town centre, um, where we had an open door. Um, people weren't running in the doors despite media coverage, <laughs> um, but we got to speak to a few key people. Uh, one of them was the 82-year-old Knut, who had recently spent like hundreds of thousands of kroners on L electrical bicycles, and that he was trying to rent out through the some um, uh, through a space in the, uh, near the supermarket. Another one was uh, Nairing Schäfen in the in the municipality, who became a key person to uh, put us in touch with uh, anyone we needed to speak to. Um, and another one was um, Hallege, a 25-year-old entrepreneur, um, who was sort of at that time wondering whether or not to move back to Hellesylt and um, start an extreme sport sort of tour. A nature guide. Uh, nature firm. guide, yeah. Mm. Uh, we also started this uh, Instagram to communicate our project um, throughout, the, throughout the semester. Uh, yeah, and uh, after what we felt was a long semester, <laughs> uh, we ended up uh, with the project 
Um, that was... Um, we proposed a series of smaller interventions and what all of these interventions had in common is that they have a starting point in uh, the existing existing qualities or, uh, or existing activities uh, in Hellesylt. Uh, it was important for us that uh, all of these interventions are... Uh, we try to make them as independent of one another as possible. Um, for for them to actually be accessible uh, to the inhabitants of Hellesylt. Um, it is, uh, they are meant as um, as an alternative to um, uh, to a development where one project steers uh, the direction of the place uh, and instead uh, that it can be fragmented and if you are actually the person uh, owning Grand Hotel, or if you um, own the uh, car, the old car workshop, uh, you as one person can start uh, start a change. Um, uh, and <coughs> sorry, um, kind of democratizing yeah. this uh, way of or the. Uh, way of mm. thinking development and it's also uh, important to point out that it's these are kind of 15 representatives of a way of thinking rather than sort of 15 answers to what can be done mm. uh, and we, we divided the interventions into two groups uh, the first six interventions uh, are all about strengthening and uh, um, strengthening the, the central, what we identified as the, cen the center in the center of Hellesylt, uh, making that a more legible place and also actually an attractive uh, place uh, in Hellesylt. Uh, the uh, rest of the interventions um, are uh, interventions that grow out from this center uh, and that highlight uh, qualities and places that we found in Hellesylt and that we thought was uh, where we found that it was necessary to do something or where we saw an opportunity or uh, yeah, what we talked about as sort of missed opportunities that where you could do something. Um, yeah, I don't know how well you see it, but this is uh, an illustration of uh, the city center of Hellesylt. Uh, and maybe Anna, you can point, but uh, you have the what we call the Knutepunkt, uh, which is uh, the center and where most of the interventions are. And then you can see how it just spreads out. Um, this is that uh, center of Hellesylt today. Um, and uh, this is where you also, this is where you arrive when you arrive by car to Hellesylt. This is where you, you always do. <laughs> which you always do. Uh, this is, this is what you, this is what meets you. Um, and uh, we think it's quite, quite obvious that it's not <laughs> necessarily very easy to understand that you uh, are where you're supposed to go, that this is that this is it. And it's also not a very attractive place. Uh, it's mostly used for parking today, uh, but it is between the school and uh, the supermarket. Uh, and this is where people meet today. And it's... Uh, uh, we... Uh, in, a, in such a small place as this, uh, we found that we needed to strengthen uh, the meeting places that already are there, instead of uh, trying to move the public square to where the view was best. Um, but yeah, rather strengthening what's already there. Uh, so this is a model we made uh, that sort of just shows how we... Um, yeah, how we uh, redid sort of the layout of that uh, space. We proposed uh, interventions uh, to the facades towards the space, uh, both opening up the uh, main uh, sort of stage at the school, uh, opening that up to the square. Um, we moved the entrance from the museum. 
that was on that side before and now towards the square. Uh, our main intervention was uh, Bygdestua, uh, which is sort of a communal house for both uh, the inhabitants of Hellesylt, but also tourists uh, coming to visit. Yeah, this uh, looks horrible. <laughs> um, yeah, but I think maybe you can see uh, the long structure uh, there. It lies directly in front of the supermarket, and it is the big dust. Uh, you enter it on the way into the store and also on the way out from the store, and it's uh, supposed to act as both both uh, uh, tourist information. It's uh, uh, where you can uh, uh, get access to rental of uh, uh, things to go out in nature. Um, but it's also where uh, the retired men of Hellesylt meet for a cup of coffee and sit all day. <laughs> so trying to program this big destue with as much uh, as possible to make it as resilient and versatile uh, became um, a, a main motive for the for the um, project um, here it's uh, illustrated how it works as a reception for a sort of integrated um, village hotel um, we use these time wheels as a tool to kind of um, measure the resilience uh, throughout the year, throughout the day, and to try to illustrate um, how the town square can be used during an everyday setting, during a kind of school show, during Hellesiltagane, uh, which is a yearly festival during the summer. Um, yeah. Yeah. And we also uh, looked at connecting. Uh, the existing pedestrian network, which is not very uh, easy to read today, uh, and made illustrations to show how uh, our interventions and uh, new connections could make uh, meaningful new spaces in, uh, in Helsinki. Um, we also looked into what sort of local industries does, does Hellesilt have. For instance, uh, this one uh, place called Formvak make vacuum-shaped plastic components. And we use that as a, a motive to make these, to design these um, vacuum plastic-shaped um, space dividers in the Vigdestue. And um, here we are in July last year uh, presenting the project at Hellesiltagane. Um, we were also lucky to uh, exhibit everything in the gymsal of the school. Um, and this was, in retrospect, the most important uh, part of the whole project. Um, we got to discuss the project sort of one-to-one -one, uh, with people there. Um, and the, the presentation uh, became sort of a tool to discuss um, uh, development in Hellesylt past sort of are you uh, for or against um, demolishing the hotel. Uh, and now, a year later, there are positive signs. Uh, Grand Hotel is not going to be demolished. Um, and they, are, uh, they have actually started uh, um, uh, sort of small renovations and have plans on renovating the whole hotel. Um, and also Helge, our friend, has really uh, started his uh, nature guide uh, firm, uh, where we um, we see that he's actually taking a lot of the things that we have discussed, both from our project and things that we have discussed with him, uh, and using that in his uh, business. Uh, so that's uh, very fun to see. Mm. Yeah, that's mm. Thank you.
We actually have two questions, one for uh, Gro, Gro and one for the two of you. Uh, Gro, uh, can you be more specific and concrete on what kind of education you would like to promote uh, to uh, on them to do to make these changes, uh, specific changes? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> to work uh, in such a way that uh, students can see the studio's uh, work, the practice uh, in the school, where they are trained to be architects in, rela in relation to their uh, to thinking. And uh, today it's like uh, one have uh, theory here and practice here, and the practitioners are not interested in theory. And, uh, and uh, one produces a lot of people uh, who takes, uh, P, uh, takes PhDs, or may, and, uh, and uh, it's, it's such a, pro a huge production of theory that doesn't really mean anything to practice. And I think that is so, such a pity. So I try to, to help the students to be aware of their language, be aware of what they are thinking. <laughs> And, and try to find their own standpoint within the field of architecture so they are able to say something that it means something in relation to what is happening out here mm. uh, in the cities. And, and uh, because um, the economy is global, globalized today, uh, and architecture has this use aspect, mm. uh, function it was called earlier, <laughs> but, we, but it's really a use aspect. This means that uh, what is happening here, what we are building here, is, is related to how they are, are able to build in other parts of the world. And I try to make the students aware of this relation and open up, uh, up their understanding for, also for the richness of <laughs> architecture. And uh, <coughs> yeah, so that is uh, one thing. So we make, uh, the students are making essays, uh, they, they, they write, they write essays not articles mm. that only deal with one smart part, a small part of, of, mm. of, the <laughs> of being here, but they write essays in, uh, where they dare to take standpo standpoints. Mm. Yeah. Any questions from this, uh, from, this very ve from this venue here in this room? No? Then I have one more question for you, Gru. Uh, well, I, I think I'll, I'll take the f next question to, to the two of you first. Um, and that is, can you say something, uh, someone asked, uh, can you say something more on how this project uh, of yours has been received, uh, especially by the opposite side, maybe? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, because we, did, we uh, didn't get to talk that much about it, but we did uh, go back and present it. And um, in Hellesylt, when we first came, uh, uh, we felt that um, most of the people that we spoke to, they were for the new hotel project. Uh, and what we felt was that it's um, when you live in a place where um, not much happens, it's very hard to say no to someone who comes and says, I want to spend 50 million or 100 million uh, on this fantastic new hotel project. Um, and that the discussion became either your um, pro the demolition of the hotel and uh, a development of Hellesylt, uh, uh, and if you're against it, you can. We can might as well move. Um, so what we felt when we came back with our uh, project was that the economic side was obviously still uh, there, but we managed to have a discussion uh, about uh, something more. Um, and tried to talk about um, yeah, nuances as well. And we feel like we've actually, of course, we met people that disagreed with us. Um, uh, but we also felt that people sort of took bits and pieces uh, of what we had done and sort of made it their own. Um, yeah, and we haven't really, with, we have no, never actually managed to discuss the project with the 
the people proposing the new hotel. So we don't know what they say. Haven't, re haven't received any hate mails. From <laughs> Okay, I think that's it for the question and answers now. So thank you to Dan Victoria and Gru also for answering. Um, we will now have uh, Pervel again, uh, and then uh, we will have a little. Um, then we will have a visit from uh, Amuna Sherry in a different way. Postpone. While, uh, while the band's tuning the instruments, uh, I hope you're all feeling well uh, here in this room and, uh, and on the stream. Um, I at least know where to go for my next uh, Norwegian summer, summer vacation. And uh, of course, we'll play the grand reopening of the Hellesilt Garn Hotel. Sure. Um, we're going to get a bit, more, a bit more jazzy, I think so you can uh, lower your shoulders a bit. Uh, this next song is called Sol or The Sun. All right, we'll, we'll do it again, we'll do it again. <laughs> we actually, we have five minutes per song, so we can, we can try uh, once more. <laughs> Let's go. Stille, stille, jeg har vekket solen Sitter ute på verandaen i nattkjolen Og der i hjørnet har en nedekopp Spunnet opp sitt fangstnett Det brytes ikke opp Stille, stille, en furus vei Eller tid, den svake brisen Hilser god morgen gjennom morgendisen Gjennom morgendisen Stille, stille, en enslig humle Sitter på en blomst, hopp i min vase 
Den har nok funnet sin nektar oase Og jeg nyter livet i kjolen Og jeg nyter livet i kjolen Og jeg nyter livet i nattkjolen For jeg, for jeg, for jeg, for jeg, for jeg Har vekket solen Mitt fat med saft i røde bær i Har gjort en måke ganske så nysgjerrig Den har nok sikkert sett ut sin mening Men solen måler sine krefter mot sky Stille, stille, en rose rister av seg Dugget fra en natt Og her på trappa slumrer nabons katt Nabons hvite katt Og jeg nyter livet i kjolen Og jeg nyter livet i kjolen For jeg, for jeg, for jeg, 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 jeg har vekket solen. Thank you. Unfortunately, due to technical problems, uh, she will not be able to stream the message uh, online. So instead, uh, we have a workaround, and that is that Johannes Fjuseberg from the board of Habitat Norway will be reading the message that she has sent over right now. And for your information, she is following the seminar. So, okay, please, Johannes. Erik Berg, Chairman of the Board, Havdat Norway. Distinguished uh, participants, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great pleasure to join you for this seminar on a change of mindsets, perspectives on place and architecture as a collect collective art, hosted by Havdat Norway. The topic of this seminar reminds me of the Abu Dhabi declared actions coming out of the World Urban Forum 10 in support, uh, in support towards achieving global urban agendas. They underscore the intimate relationship between urban development, culture, creativity, and innovation, reaffirming on four areas, namely, one, culture is fundamental, is fundamental to identify and heritage, to uh, identify and heritage, and is an integral, integral part of the solution to the challenges of urbanization. Two, cities are the incubators of social, economic, environmental, mental, political and cultural progress. Three, data, innovation, and advances in science and technology with policy is, with, with policy is critical for implementing the NUA and achieving the SDGs. Four, action and, com uh, and commitments by actors at the local, at local, national, and global level levels are necessary in support of the NUA and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Today, the notion of culture understood in its broad sense of knowledge, art, belief, capabilities, habits, morals, and behaviors plays a key role in creation of distinct and collaborative places. 
Cities and towns have the cultural diversity, creative, creative capital, vitality, social infrastructure, and career choices to help attract the skills and talents required uh, to reimagine re our shared future. Today, more than half of the world's population, 3.5 billion people, 54% of the, of, uh, of the uh, inhabitants on Earth, lives in cities and other urban areas. And this is, and this is projected to rise to six out of every 10 people by 2030, and further to seven out of every 10 people by 2050. Cities are engines of economic, uh, economic growth. They are the driving force for national economies and the global economy, generating 80% of the global GDP. This is a clear indication that if, if well executed and, and well managed urbanization can be a significant contri uh, contributor to sustainable growth and development. Besides, 60% of the urban, urban footprint that will exist in 2030 does not exist today. And 75% of the infrastructure that will exist, uh, will exist then is yet not built. This presents urban development uh, decision makers and their creative industries and civil society actors with an opportunity to rethink the city, integrating the principles, principles of place, culture, heritage, neighbor, neighbor, neighborhood planning, sustainability, safety, and equality. The Sustainable Development Goals and the New Urban Agenda tells, tell us that sustainable urbanization is an opportunity to foster people-centered cities that are environmentally aware and safe, as well as inclusive and productive. UN Habitat experience shows that inclusive public space is a critical infrastructure for achieving sustainable, sustainable development. Anchored on four P's, public, private, people, partnerships. You Inhabitants promotes placemaking, including gamification, such as Minecraft through the block-by-block block methodology to enhance partic participatory urban planning and design in order to co-create authentic and collaborative people places driving on local knowledge, assets, and meanings. Every year, through the Block by Block Partnership, UN Habitat supports over 30 communities in different cities, uh, working in co collaboration with children, youth, and women to collectively uh, reimagine public spaces and their communities, leveraging local creative capital, local assets, and knowledge to create collaborative people places and to reinvent their communities. This approach has proven to help co-produce shared visions, bringing forward community aspirations and priorities through implementation of urban interventions, resulting into unique places with distinct characters and identities. Art has also proven to be an important tool for inspiring a change of mindset and behavior change and mobilizing local voices. Through placemaking weeks in Nairobi, Maputo, Cairo, Kuala Lumpur, Mexico City, and Wuhan, United uh, UN Habitat works closely with cities, learning and implementing partners and local communities to, to deploy creative and tactical placemaking to, to, to celebrate local places, testing design and social programming ideas, creating spaces for urban experimentation, meaningful public engagement, and evidence for longer team change. In Nairobi, in Nairobi, UNHAP supports community-led urban, urban reg registration efforts through innovative neighborhood youth competitions to transform wasteland into shared communities, community uh, amenities. More recently, UN Habitat has partnered with local graffiti artists in the, in the city to, con to convey messages on COVID-19 in Matara and informal settlements in Nairobi and in Matatu. Matatus. In Kabul and 11 other main Afghan cities under the Clean Green Cities program, UN Habitat is using placemaking, including art, 
and co-creation processes to rebuild neighborhoods, public spaces, including public facilities, breaking gender stereotypes and, ch and championing the participation of women and girls in urban rehabilitation and wider urban development discourse. These inclusive processes emphasize the collaborative making that, build, that builds local capacity and leadership to empower communities. It is therefore imperative to look back to place-based to place planning and, des and, and design to reinvent places, neighborhoods, and cities. On behalf of you and Habitat, I reiterate our commitment to, prov uh, to providing a better quality of, uh, of life in an urbanizing world, to implementing the new urban ag agenda, and to strengthening the partnership with Norway and Habitat Norway to delivering on this ambitious, ambitious goal. Let us leverage this opportunity space created by COVID-19 uh, pandemic to rethink our urban model, to be different and bold, taking an, opportunity, uh, an, an appropriate, appropriate stand on what we want to change and how. Looking into the, COVID, COVID, uh, the post-COVID future, I welcome uh, welcome you to view our strategic plan 20, 2020 to 2023 and our flagship program on inclusive, vibrant neighborhoods and communities. It aims to transform deprived areas, areas and strategic, strategic locations of the city into connected, dynamic, diverse and vibrant, uh, vibrant neighborhoods that in incubate social, economic and environmental development for entire uh, cities and their uh, respective hinterland. We look forward to advancing this course together. Finally, let us commit to, do to doing all we can to ensure no one and no place is left behind. Thank you. Thank you very much for these words from uh, Maimuna Sharif. Uh, the executive director of UN Habitat. Habitat, uh, I, I trust that uh, these words uh, from Amuna Sharif will be an inspiration, and I hope for the rest of the seminar, and also for the finalizing of the 10 points of action that we will conclude in, this, uh, in the end of this seminar. Habitat Norway is looking forward to continue the good cooperation with UN Habitat. Already on the World Habitat Day of 5th of October. Then we hope to launch the UN Habitat flagship report on cities and pandemics. So then we proceed in the planned uh, program. She was planned in, but not here. Um, Alfonso Rengifu was that rightly pronounced? <laughs> we will <not> <laughs> Uh, have a presentation under the title Architects Without Borders and the SDG 11 on the ground, experience and challenges. Just a few words about you. You are a director of the Architects Without Borders, uh, Norway and, uh, and an experienced architect. You are founding board of a uh, member of the AutoCAD Computer Aided Design and professional graduate, graduated at the BI Norwegian Business uh, school. So after the presentation, uh, we will also have a Q&A. Thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon. Uh, as you said, my name is Alfonso Renjifo. I'm the director and one of the founders for Architects Without Borders here in Norway. Uh, I, I will introduce to you organization and how we work to be uh, inclusive and create the sense of ownership in our clients and the communities that our projects will have an effect on. For this, I will not go into detail with the different projects, but how a way of thinking influences the project development. First, uh, who are we? We are part of ASF, which is the International Association of, uh, for Architects Without Borders. Uh, they are over 24 country members, and we, were, we became part of them in 2016. Locally, we started three years ago with uh, nine architects. 
uh, with the idea of how we can help uh, seeing how and how good we have it here in Norway and seeing that this didn't exist as a chapter. Uh, currently, we have over 40 members and we have a branch in Oslo and uh, Stavanger. We have projects in uh, six different places at the moment in Argentina, Ethiopia, Sierra Leona, Kenya, Laos, and here in Norway. So our first project in Ethiopia is a residential and educational center. Uh, this building was, was the purpose was to help girls, young girls uh, in high school to have a refuge. Girls that either live too far from the, from the school or live in the streets so they have a place to stay and then in the weekends they could go back to their homes. Uh, the way that we work with this is partnership for change and region NGO got in, got in touch with us and asked us to give, us this, give them the support for the architectural part. And in part, they have also CK Women's Development Association, which is the local association there that will help them to develop and control the project. Before we even start uh, to design, one of our members traveled to the site, to the current building they use, and sat with the, with the girls of the community. Um, she did a three-day workshop to try to understand their needs and how they use the building, how the community can be benefit for a new building. Uh, some of the things that we learned is that uh, a few of the girls of the, the, that use this space are blind. But then, in this, in six of as an architect, we can do something about it. And one of the things they told us, no, you can't do anything specifically for them. Because when they leave this place, then nowhere in Sinetopia exists this type of architecture. So then they will go back to where they belong, to where they start before. Um, when we start the project, we continue the communications with the community, with the local government, and the first, uh, the first, time, the first project was this size, but this was the existing uh, building. And they want us to create a new building in that space, we present it to the local government, and they like it so much, the proposal, that then they give us the neighbor site. And they ask us to propose something to include into the community so they, they can have some common spaces, some sports, some library, cafe, that they can use it. Again, new development, start from scratch. We present it again and again. They said, well, why don't we take this land instead of that one? And they give us a space that's more than 10 times the space of the previous one. So that's the, the one that we have at the moment. We finished the, the budget and we're gonna start, we were gonna start just at the beginning of the year, but because of the situation has been postponed, but now it's, going, it's about to start uh, the project. Um, we'll not go into detail. If you want more details, you can go to our website and see more. But this is just how we interact with the community to get the project and how it grows from something so small to something that will affect all the community. In Argentina, we have a couple of projects in Argentina. The first one is a craft house in the north of Argentina, which the way we interact with them is that a local architect and a local sociologist uh, got in touch with us and proposed a project. And they travel and spend a week with the community learning the, what they were, their needs, the current needs for a space like this. What happened at the moment is that they produce this handcraft and then big companies come and buy by the bulk, buy by the bulk and sell, sell them in Buenos Aires on, or, or export them abroad for a uh, big amount of money, while well, they get very little uh, for their work. So by having a craft house uh, near a, a point where they can sell themselves, they can keep their, their profit, but also it's a place where their older generations can pass their knowledge down to new generations. Um, we started this project uh, contacting again the local community, see if we could get a, a site for the project. At the beginning, they give us a, a space there for free, the owner of the land, then he changed his mind, he moved it there, and now finally we have this space, which is in the main road that communicates uh, Argentina with uh, Uruguay, if I'm not wrong. This is how the land looks in, in the area. And then with all the information we receive from them, with, with the local architect and the sociologist being there, we managed to have uh, a development of the projects and learning things that they would like and not like for it. For example, they don't want a toilet 
inside the common space. They want it separate from the common space. Uh, they don't like glass. They don't want windows in the building. Everything has to be very open or work it in, in a way that there's no glass involved. So this kind of, of information uh, help us to develop the project, to contact the local manufacturers and use the local brick, and then develop the project uh, to just use the local source materials. Uh, another project in Argentina is, is in Buenos Aires, it's a neighborhood. Uh, they, the, this community of 90 families received uh, a piece of land from the government over 10 years ago. I didn't have the opportunity to develop it or do anything with it without with it. Again, the, the same local architect and sociologist told us about this project and how we could help them. So we helped them to develop the urban planning and the plotting so each family could have a space to, 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 for their home. Um, it's, it's in the, now it's in the final process of approving. And uh, in one of the houses, what we did was uh, we wanted to propose a house that we will grow with family the way the Latin families are. Kids not really move out of the home, they bring their families and a family of two parents with two kids will become a grandparents family kids in the same space. So we wanted a space that could uh, help the purpose and subdivide and become different apartments. For these, we got in touch with AHO and uh, with a proposal for one of the semesters that the students will develop the idea of the project. So we started with 16 students making 16 proposals and through the semester it will be selected to the final proposal. But the entire process was also in communication with the community in Buenos Aires. So we kept sending every time there was the 16 proposals. The local architect will go and, and uh, have a meeting with the community leaders, show them their proposals, and they will make comments on which one they like the most and what will not work one or the other. At the end, then we came to the, uh, to the final design and the students travel for five weeks to build this, uh, this house. Uh, with the help of the community, they were involved, they were all the time helping us to get the materials, feeding the students and helping uh, through the day labor. This is the final result of, the ha of, of their work. At the moment, it's been used as a, as a refuge center for women that uh, suffer from violence at home. So, and uh, the, these uh, final drawings are being tweaked so they can, they can present it to the community to the government when they ask for a loan to keep building the, the next, their own houses. Here in Norway, uh, we have something called the Urban Experiment that was developed by our branch in Stavanger. The main uh, objective of this project wasn't the project itself, but the process. And it was to get the refugees involved and uh, being able to show their, their, uh, their knowledge. So we had electricians, we have carpenters, architects, that then got together and the, gov uh, the local government gave us a piece of land that could be used for them to create this uh, architecture, which will help, will serve as a uh, gathering point where they can be together, have a coffee, showcase their art. So as you can see, uh, there was a painter who makes some murals, there was carpenters that make some wood, uh, wood, wood work. And then at the end, we showcase all the people that were involved through the, through the whole process. And it, it was not just them, but the people around, when they saw what was happening, they asked, how can we help? People from US, it happened that they were passing by and then they stayed three days working with them. Uh, local shops donated uh, flowers, plants, dirt, different kind of things. So it's, it gives that sense of purpose and community and also for the community itself to talk with the, the, the people arriving from other countries and how they could benefit from them. So it's, it's, it for us, it's a good showcase of, of their skills. Uh, in Kenya, in Kenya, we're working with uh, for Ecomojo, it's an organization that uh, is building a school there, and uh, 
we have already a whole has built several of their classrooms that you see on the top. Uh, we start by helping them to, to develop a master plan, which they will use to gather funds. So it's a five, 10 year plan of how the school is going to grow. Uh, and one of the physical projects that we were involved with, with in collaboration with Architectopia and the architect John Jan Kutsmiski, that uh, there's two classrooms, two kindergarten classrooms that they needed at the moment. So then the way we got involved with this is that, again, get the community involved all the time. So once the project was finished, designed and have a budget, uh, Jan, who also was in the project development, he traveled to the site um, and spent several days with the builders and the local builders fine-tuning the materials, what can be used, what can be changed, what's local, what can be used that will be more beneficial for the community. Just by doing that, for example, in a budget that was originally 180,000, it would drop to 150,000 kroners. By researching and, and using local source materials and all the people, the local workers, local builders. Uh, this, we're very proud, this has been long listed in the DCN Award 2020 for small buildings. Uh, we're waiting for the results next month. Uh, been going very fast, you told me to go fast. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so well, feel free to con uh, check our website if you want to become a member, if you want to help and uh, make it a donation. The different architectural office uh, get involved as an office or individuals can get involved. So when the projects come out, we usually put them on Facebook and those who want to get involved, just let us know and then we put together. Now we're starting a project in Laos, which is a recycling center, which is a community that was displaced from the jungle by the government. And now because they were not used to the modern commodities, then they just use all these plastic bottles, plastic uh, uh, containers, then they just throw them in the street. So now they, this organization uh, is trying to teach them to recycling and then using as an eco brick. And we're helping them with the project to have a space for this purpose. Thank you very much, uh, Dinkifo. Um, <laughs> Johannes, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. Uh, two questions. Questions. Um, how? Um, no, I'll take the second one first. <laughs> From where does uh, Architects Without Borders uh, mobilize uh, their financial and uh, human? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like all, all our members here in Norway are are uh, pro bono. They give the work for free, and usually we work on or spare time or on the weekends. Mm -hmm. uh, when the, an office is involved, in some cases, the company gives them time to work through the week. So uh, then they can have maybe a few hours a week or a few hours a month, and then they are allowed to put it towards their, their work to the office. Uh, one of our main objectives is that every time we involve like the local region Argentina, we will help raise the funds. So people engaged outside Norway, they will be paid for their services. How we raise the funds is with the same, different architectural companies. They give us uh, funds towards the project or towards, uh, or towards AUG itself. Uh, the membership comes to pay for these expenses. So usually because, uh, for example, our office, uh, I sit with two other architectural offices that give me the space for free. Autodesk is donating software. Microsoft is donating software. So our current expense is quite small. It's like 15,000 kroners a year that we have to pay for website, insurance, and Adobe, which don't send anything for free. <laughs> but then everything else that we receive from the members and from the nations either go, to, uh, go towards the projects, different projects. Thank you. And uh, how was the experience with dealing with, uh, with local governments, both in Formosa and uh, Buenos Aires? Yeah, and with that we have uh, some experience ourselves, because one of the members is Argentina, I'm from Colombia, uh, so we know that it, it is, it's been taking three years to get this to this point. Most of our projects have been, been that long. So the project in Ethiopia, we started three years ago, and it's always 
like keep talking with the local governments takes time and it takes months and then trying to come on please give us a result and then no we're going to change government we have to wait until see who's coming in charge and then that will affect what we can tell you so it's it's always been uh, very long term in contrast the person in kenya didn't have to deal with anybody it's in the middle of of the bush mm -hmm. so then we started the project in august and it was finished built end of november no need to apply or anything we just build it done the other projects two three years for development because of that long process and communication thank you if there are any questions we'll answer them online on the on the youtube uh, channel okay thank you very much again the next lecture is um, called architecture architecture as uh, placemaking uh, and uh, we have here <laughs> alfredo brillenburg um, you are a renowned architect, uh, born in Caracas, Venezuela, co-founder of the interdisciplinary design firm Urban Think Tank. Um, Alfredo has taught internationally at the Graduate School of Architectural and Planning, Columbia University, and at the ETH in Zurich, I am informed. And you have uh, received several prestigious awards uh, for innovative contribution to ecological and social design practices. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, and, uh, and thank you, Alfonso, for that uh, wonderful uh, presentation of Without Borders. Um, I think it's very relevant for the work that we've been doing also, working a little bit like Mother Teresa, you know, and uh, yet making a lot of social impact. So I really appreciate it. Oh. <clears throat> Some of you now heard I'm from Caracas. Caracas has been 20 years in a revolution. Um, it's made us our work very difficult and always conflictive. So I would say that architecture and urbanism is frozen politics, um, as you were saying, Alfonso, just before. Um, however, given the chance we have now uh, in the COVID situation and the latest UN report that has been just released, uh, 2019, uh, where it says 1.8 billion people worldwide live homelessly or in inadequate housing. So I think this is the moment to really push. And uh, talking with Ellen now just a few minutes ago, we, uh, Ellen said, it's incredible. We put a man on the moon. I have, why can't we change the way we build things? Um, and I said that maybe some of you might remember a musician called Gil Scott Heron uh, from the 1970s, really talented guy. He actually invented rap, um, and you can read more about it. He had a rap called Whitey on the Moon. And he says, well, they put a Whitey on the moon, but my sister got bit by a rat, and now her she's, body's infected. But Whitey's on the moon. So who do I send the bill to to repair my housing uh, project in Harlem? Well, Whitey's on the moon. And so he goes on to say, uh, to say that. And he basically says, well, I'll send the bill to Whitey on the moon. That's the end of that one. Um, uh, oh, but it has a lot of relevance today because, as you all know, the situation in the United States, particularly in uh, in, in uh, social housing, is quite serious. And I am deeply concerned with this problem. If you look at this map, it's research done by us with Harvard, um, you will see pixelated a real scale of what's going to happen between now and 2050. This is the expansion of the areas in which the next two billion people will come onto the Earth. And you will see that it's Africa that will grow, of course, <clears throat> South America, sorry, South, um, South Asia, Africa, and South America. It's the global south, and we're in the global north. What do we have to do? We have to collaborate. It's one world. It's one urbanized planet. There's no other way around it. And as you all know, with the recent grassroots movements of uh, uh, talking about oppression, Black Lives Matter, right? And it's I am when I wander, and I'm, you know, I have an office and I was teaching in Switzerland, and I see a lot of people marching for Black Lives. But then I'm asking, 
What are they going to do? Are they raising money to send to Africa? Are they just supporting a political movement in the United States? Or are they going to open the immigration borders for Switzerland? Because it's not clear what we are marching for in the North, unless we're willing to help and really help and get involved. It's not just lip service. So if you go to back to South Africa, and particularly where I think the fight for apartheid uh, and the resistance against it was so significant, you will see that they used to plan, right? The modernist architects would plan cities with white, black, and the center was excluding the black. This is actually a generic plan for settling white CBD, Indian CBD, um, res residential industrial areas, et cetera, and colored group areas. And they would plan, plan cities that way. This is the way the townships were planned. This is stills from an old movie. This is the resistance movement burning their identity cards, which, uh, which, and then here, of course, the aggressive police violence and Mandela finally uh, coming. Well, I tell you today, Mandela did a lot of change, and he did build social housing. He called them RDP housing, and he said everyone is entitled to one into a home, right? And, and mandatory, and said the government will pay for this. Unfortunately, it's very hard to undo apartheid. It's not working. So what you got in the cities all around Johannesburg and the big cities like Cape Town around the airport is you have slums proliferating everywhere. Why? Because the government couldn't keep up with the promise of a free house for everyone. And certainly not the free house, which is a suburban track house, right? And this is the world map that we've recently done modeling on the UN information. And you will see that we have a major emigration uh, situation over there between Colombia and Venezuela. Colombia has received more than 3 million Venezuelans. So that's quite a lot. That's half the population of Norway have left Venezuela. So it's not the problem. It's not only in Africa. As I say, it relates to all of us in South America. Here you see some of the images. Um, so the point of departure of architecture for me is its inability to respond to the urgent issues of humanity. Our hope is that we use the individual architects, groups, societies, and pause and reflect on the human societal condition of this new millennium. We're for that. We're coming out with a new magazine called Parangole, which you guys will all receive because it's sponsored uh, in part by University of Bergen. And uh, it'll be 200 pages on uh, a yearly journal that we're releasing. Global displacement, as I said, is at a record high um, of 41 million people globally displaced um, and refugees, 26 million. So I think with this lecture, what I want to provoke is a discussion on human nature and imagine a new alternative future from Norway, from the global north. And that's why I'm here. Power back to the people. But in order to do that, we need to transfer uh, funds. Yes, it has to do with development funds because people know how to build their cities, but they don't have the resources. So people are facing specific challenges and vulnerabilities. With our South Africa project, which I'll show in a moment, we bring together researchers, practitioners, activists, artists, aiming to inspire collective efforts in thinking about interacting with these issues, using the spatial lens in adaptive uh, interventions. We want to create a new regime of coexistence, of building cities. These are some of the actors that have been our clients in Venezuela, brothers, sisters, grandmothers, gra uh, grandsons, etc. Because the city is, yes, about economy, social, environment, and politics, but it's essentially about people. So we, the architect who have been the master builders designing cities, right, and uh, signing our designs, um, have to 
really release that and understand that we're just moderators, vehicles for development. Of course, some of you know Urban Think Tank's first works. This is how we built the vertical gymnasium in doing little sports activities in the barrios of Caracas. So it's asking people if what they want. If they had asked the, uh, during, uh, the apartheid, well, how do people want to be housed and live, they would have done a much better city than the townships. So using live reporting, photojournalists, design examples, um, we want to create this Nordic dialogue, if you want. Um, we're committed to presenting those ideas and share that critical view with you and with the world. And this is, these are some of the photos that we began to take, and then we did documentation and research with each one of these individuals to understand, to interpret, to act where, to identify with whom we need to work and return the right to the city, the right to infrastructure, the right to housing, right to democratic cities, safe cities, safe homes. Our new book's just about to be released now in December, just before November it should come out by Hansje Kanz. Um, but basically, a project of architecture requires all of this complexity if you really want to make an appropriate design. It's not the architect sitting in his office sending drawings down to a contractor. That won't work. Why? Because you have the right on the ground, which we call the practical law, which is the law of the people who have settled the land. You have the constitutional law, Mandela created, and then you have the real estate market, property law, which defines the values of all these things, right? And so these three are in conflict with each other. How are you going to navigate that? Right? This is the RDP house that Mandela promised to everyone. It was a good idea initially, but there's not enough urban land. So each time they had to push out of the city. This has even happened in Mexico, right? They pushed all those housing projects outside of Mexico. For who, for what? Impossible to get infrastructure, transportation, etc. So it was a good idea initially, but it wasn't sustainable because we, urban land needs to go up in vertical, right? And until we saw this shack, we got the eureka moment, where we started to say, let's do the growing house, which of course um, has been widely documented. And people can add as many windows as they need. The architect doesn't have to be there. We just have to create a system. So we went to that, and this is originally the Caracas growing house, where uh, there's always a shack that begins a cut in the hill, right? We call them pirate urbanists. And then over time, they put some columns in, everyone knows how to build, and then over brick infill, and then you go to a second floor, and then you rent the first floor, and you become a developer. These are pirate developers. Why not transfer the idea of thousands of developers? Why does the real estate market need to hold that only value. Why? Because the system, since the uh, turn of the 20th century, United States commercialized city land, right? And the growing house keeps on going up until you have urban gardens on the top, etc. And you can see how a house goes from five square meters per person to 16 square meters per person in 25 years. They grow it. They grow the spaces themselves, right? And Previ in Peru was an experimental project promoted by the UN. I'm sure all of you know it. It's worth taking a view at it and, and understanding how we can return to experimental housing. And I'll have to rapid fire this one, but when we saw MK building his own house with a store on the bottom, we said, that's sustainable. That's how we pay for the house. We bring in a double-story, triple-story unit, and people can have shops on the ground floor. We combine it. So we put together $3,000, and we built it. No permits at all. We didn't ask for anything. Why should we? It's actually the individual building his own shack again, right? And here you go. The house went up. Up. This is Pumezo. He's become the number one activist with his own uh, NGO now today. And this then became the community house. And with the community house began the project. You see? So sometimes the first move is not 
the ultimate move. The, you do it incrementally until you get the process in order. So we began thinking, okay, we can make these individual houses with shared toilets. It wasn't a bad idea, but what was the, the thing we didn't think about? If a fire goes in one house, they, a kerosene lamp goes over, which happens often, and in Cape Town the wind blows like crazy, it would still light the whole place on fire. So we had to introduce firewalls. When, so we did a census, we found out who could pay what, we declared the whole land one cooperative, where people could buy and sell land with each other. A very interesting idea. And so you could get money for land you gave up. And we used an app, with that, which I won't play it today, um, to in order to divide land and to develop a whole plug-in system, um, which we call an agent-based agent program, where we could create row houses that, was in, that were intelligently combined like Rubik cubes, right? And then we could see and look the density required to fill up these blocks of row houses, and people could build those houses themselves over time, which is wonderful. So we began a whole program of instructing the very uh, individuals who are squatting the land to redo their own properties with firewalls, et cetera. So we created a house that's half a house, or let's say it's more than a, a house, because it can go up, you can add another floor, and you infill with the very material that you had before, right? Here you see it. Very simple, windows will be opened as the uh, user um, has enough money. Those were the first prototypes. These are the final ones where the whole block has been redone and they've taken the initiative to paint uh, their houses with a kind of barcode, funny enough, which was kind of a markings of each house, right? Here you see it and it's, it's in between, it's a hybrid between formal housing and informal housing. And because it is a hybrid between the two, the city had to permit it to happen because you're allowed to upgrade for fire in emergency housing. And that's how we got around the loophole. Um, yeah, that's it. And here you see the open space that we were able to create for a playground and the houses that will be finished over time. Here you see already the rooms stuccoed by the people themselves who are now inhabiting the houses. So we were quite surprised that you think there's no money, but there is money if you give them security of tenureship. And people will invest and put all of their hard-earned money and uh, creches are opening up in the ground floor of the house. And this is the public space, a triangular public space, where we're doing now a playground. And the playground is with a Berlin artist, Jeffrey James. And the, the pieces are heavy pieces, either filled with sand out of resin or even soft, rounded concrete. We're not sure. But the idea is that no one will build shacks on the open space because out of necessity, people will squat the open space. So here are the prototypes being done by us to build this playground, and the pieces can be combined, and the community will decide how those pieces will be combined. Um, so for the people, conclusion. We, all of us, can open up a critical thinking, a more healthy public discourse, exploring and expanding public opinion, and understanding the depths, reach, impact, and continuous globalization and migration will play, and impact us in the coming years. So for humanitarians, this demonstrates an overlapping complex urban condition, what urban conditions can create. For theoreticians, it can serve as a critical lens for understanding how complex issues of displacement migration are impacted by spatial configuration. For the architect, it shows how underlining complex realities drive displacement and migration can inform good design solutions. And for the Norwegians, legislators and public governmental officials, our work can be a tool to prepare new policies for future waves of migration that will come. Thank you. Uh, stage, because we have uh, one question, don't we? Oh. Um, can you 
can you give us some thoughts on um, sure. why why you think international uh, aid has not taken these these things into uh, their practical work in in well in international aid? Yeah. So the the history of international aid, I don't have to go through it, um, has been very varied. Correct. But let's say if international aid could uh, could put money into research, that would be the key. So in other words, aid, the problem with the whole thing is that all project development funds, right, for international development aid, always comes with the final solution in hand. In other words, they approve a project based on a drawing, on a, on a building or on a typology or on something that, that has been approved. And that's the problem. In order to do a good project, we need six months earlier to do the research. So research funds before any project must be built in before the design solutions are approved or implemented. And I think so, We and, and also always it should be a co understanding that design is key. So design has been undermined. Des the design professional has been, has lost its validity in the development process of cities. And this is, a, this is basically because we've become subservient to, to uh, all whims and all developers and all commercial activities. And I think, which is not the case until the 1960s and 70s. Up to then, there was a clear lineage, and you can read it in Modern Architecture by Kenneth Frampton, the book. You will see that in the, f in the first um, 70, 80 years of the 20th century, good, critical, modern architecture always had at the heart of it a social impact performance. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so now we are proceeding to the last speaker, who is Ellen de Wiebe. She's former chief Tom town planner in the city of Oslo, and her lecture is called Yes, We Can, Balancing Interest Groups in Urban Development Processes. Um, Ellen is an architect and urban planner who graduated from the University of Wales. Uh, she's a renowned public discussant, and to my knowledge, uh, after she retired, an activist uh, uh, for the preservation of the so-called Ybloka in Oslo, known for the unity of Picasso's art and Victor's architecture. Today, we are happy to have Ellen as an executive board member in Habitat Norway. Uh, please, Ellen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation to talk here at Urban uh, Thinkers Campus and at the uh, Habitat Norway seminar. Um, I will try to define some few uh, initiatives uh, for achieving better places in architecture. And of course, it will be based on my experience from having worked in Oslo. Um, yes, this was supposed to be the first picture. Uh, my first position is that whether we talk about Christian Nordberg Schulz, Aldo Rossi, Jan Gehl, or the recently Sejan Sarkis, he's an immigrant um, uh, writer in Norway, and in his new novel, he praises the Picasso um, decorated Y block that uh, Kerstin mentioned, the government building that is presently being pulled down. Um, and in spite of civil disobedience, where about 60,000 Norwegians and foreigners uh, have wanted this building to be conserved, myself being part of a training, a training group uh, uh, at the building and being put in jail for a couple of hours, it is still being pulled down. And in many ways, I think I have to accept that the atmosphere, the way that you actually perceive this space and this building is perceived differently by people. So there isn't one genus Loki, there are many different ones and that's the challenge we have to work with. I will say something quickly about the goals of urban development, some things about some challenges. 
uh, about the different roles of the different bodies involved, and then at the end, something about what I call the added value of property development. Um, urban development is always about balancing different interests and values. In many ways, it's a struggle for the ownership to the city. I think we all know that. Um, to the left, you can see the Norwegian sort of interpretation of the UN Climate Goals by Gro Sancia Hansen. And to the right, um, of course, the Norwegian planning and building law has a lot of dilemmas related to balancing. Uh, a new development and conservation is clearly stated as a right through the planning law. Environmental short and long term potentials and consequences should be balanced. Private and public development needs as opposed to children's or elderly people's needs. Uh, and of course, aesthetics and nature qualities. And given these demanding challenges, what is then possible to achieve? My second position is that uh, the import of international ideas, like, for instance, seafront warehousing from the Hanseatic uh, towns, or today with high-rise buildings, the important aspect is how these ideas and concepts are applied locally. It's not the fact that they are actually international. It's the kind of sensitivity we use when we apply them that is important. Here you see the barcode and one of the 13 commons in Fjord City, the station common next to it. And of course, local needs, being it both human or biological ones, must be met. Nature, however, requires normally long-term strategies to keep diversity, uh, 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 to keep and to develop diversity. Here you see the Alna River, um, where principles for biological ecology uh, was used to purify the polluted, the polluted part of the river in a very short uh, uh, space of time, two or three years doing away with a lot of transport of polluted grounds and depositing it uh, somewhere else. So it can be done in short term um, uh, terms as well. Um, and local needs is about exploring physical and social cultural potentials, for instance, through temporary activities. Um, art projects, the tree to the left has fabrics from um, immigrant women or temporary concerts or uh, autumn walks along the river may be equally important to keep or to cater for the local needs. But of course, there are lots of challenges, and I'll mention three of them. Very often, public policies and debate, I would state, is a struggle between different middle classes. Uh, here you see our Deputy Commissioner for Urban Development, Hanna Markusen, who had to have pol police escort to get to this meeting, where the bungalow owners were very angry because one proposed traffic node development. How then for the voiceless voices? Secondly, strong economic layers is always overlaid the urban fiscal structure. And um, Eric Berg mentioned Saskia Assassin's theory about this earlier. Um, to the left, you see what we call the City Hive Ecological Innovation Center, which was established to make the people, the inhabitants, the people at large, uh, being able to sort of learn and to express and to exchange experiences on how to manage their own local communities. And to the right, you can see the results of a city life survey, not very new, but still, um, where we had very few uncomfort and, and uncomfortable public uh, benches. They might even be described as aggressive architecture, as opposed to a lot of paying uh, seating places where you couldn't sit down for free. We also found that although the city center in many ways was quite well kept, uh, children and elderly people were poorly catered for, and of course the winter provisions were not very good either. So I think in order to balance some of these groups and this, the different needs, it's important to have deliberate public interventions uh, in place. And of course the main 
challenge, which I think um, Alfredo Wittenberg showed us very clearly, is that often deprived areas lack uh, the, the necessary funding to look after their local authorities. Um, in this case, I've shown you the Alta River, uh, which for 150 years was strongly populated, maybe polluted. Uh, but then at one stage, when one realized that the socioeconomic challenges were growing too much, the city of Oslo and the central federal government provided earmarked funding, which has then been implemented over a couple of decades to improve, for instance, the blue and the green structure for recreational purposes. So the necessity for funding is very clear. Um, I believe that there is a role for all these three different bodies in urban development. Um, and I would start with visions. To create common goals, the visions are important. And they should be uh, established early. It is about setting the agenda, it's about uh, setting uh, the physical structure that you want in the long term, and it's about the methods. It's not about the details, but it's about in which direction you want to walk. And Hovenbyen, as you see here, you can notice on the left the big green ring, which is a sort of recreational structure passing through very different types of areas. Um, and um, the, it is about the need to create public services, for instance, a polytechnic up to the right, and to reuse existing buildings like the Oxford Tower. All of this in order to mature and to make the area belong to people in a, to a greater degree. Another example is the Fjord City Plan. Nine kilometers of um, harbor promenade with ample public space I think the need for ample public space will not decrease after the COVID-19 period, rather the opposite. Public facilities at each bay and each point of land, and certain commons penetrating into the center to uh, give people access to the fjord. Very sort of deliberate strategies, but how it's being designed and built in the end uh, develops as we go along. Um, I think the last four or five years, the strongest shift in mindset has been uh, how we are influenced, and um, we are influenced, and the planners, and um, also we are influencing people's expectations, because they expect to be able to participate. For instance, when it come to, comes to using communal space, to the right you see edible plants uh, in planters on previous car parking spaces being picked by the public at large. And to the left you see different types of temporary activities related to the car-free livability program than the, that we carried out for some years. The Danish uh, uh, managed public management has a concept called uh, Local Authority 3.0. After the war, uh, local authority won zero. Uh, people came um, modestly and asked for services. During the 1980s, the public participated, for instance, in uh, old age pensioners policies, but it was always the city that decided what type of services should pr be provided. And now we are into the uh, phase of co-creation and co-ownership. Um, and it could take place in different ways. Temporary activities that you see here, uh, elderly or age-friendly city being involved, or just walking along the street blowing soap bubbles. Uh, and I often call this um, the paradise of co-creation. It's a temporary allotment gardens put in a green space zoned area um, with a bread baking house. Um, it has a temporary planning permission, building permission. I'm sure it will last forever. And of course that requires that as a public body, as a planning department, we have to take the risk and to recognize that some initiatives are uh, so valuable that we have to do away with the planning zoning codes. That's not easy, but it's fun when we do it. I've talked about the long-term visions and the short-term um, activities, temporary activities, but you also need the semi-permanent initiatives. Um, 
Uh, for instance, uh, action program for better city life and livability that we've been working out on for quite a few years. It was a kind of SWOT analysis. Uh, it is a book of ideas that have been cost evaluated, and it gives impact into the budget processes. We know that the results that are going to be carried out will not be what is shown in that book. Um, but it helps us to give focus and secure funding uh, on these semi-temporary uh, activities. A completely different point I would like to make now is that public projects are very often and increasingly so under strict uh, economic regimes. Uh, and a lot in Norway, public bodies build a lot. Um, I did mention the battle for the conservation of the Y block. Uh, and to the left, you can see what that uh, environment could be like uh, after the renewal of the government buildings. The critical phase in that decision to pull it down was not the zoning phase. It was the concept cost analysis, the analysis that went advan in advance of that. Unlucky premises were decided related to densities and security. And the crucial cultural, architectural, and historic values are lost. And I think in many ways, it is about the lack of linkage between the planning law, which should be based on public participation, and the central government rules for how you handle investment projects. Um, to the right, you see what I guess we could call Big Distuve, or the city sitting room. Uh, um, in this case, the new library, Björvika Library, the Dijkman Library, which I think is a generous interior public space. Uh, and in that case, we did actually manage to combine the concept for the uh, cost, um, uh, concept cost analysis, um, and the zoning process. And I think it has turned out quite well. Um, but that is more by luck than by, or some professional intentions, than by uh, the status of the legal framework. Um, I do believe that private developers may have a role to play. We often say that they're only out for profit and so on. But I think they actually do have a role to play if we are good commissioning bodies. Uh, in the planning and building agency, um, we often talked about the added value of private development. That is, not only should the product itself have quality, but it should always add something more to the city as a whole. Um, in Norway, there's a lot of private plans and projects being carried out. And to the left, you see the new guidelines provided by the planning department quite recently, after my time, I must say, although it was initiated when I was there. Um, and when we talk about workshops, public meetings, mind mapping, survey of children's tracks, the main point, of course, is that it's the early communication between the bodies and the parties and the people involved that is important and makes a difference. But um, handling different types of property development also means that at master plan level, it's important that the city uh, can commission quality early and clearly. And if you don't manage to state things in ma manners that can be sort of measured, uh, it's very difficult to get these qualities in. Um, different types of quality norms give predictability. It gives uh, an agenda and principles and vocabulary for discussing quality. And I think that's very important independent on what type of theory you base your work on. For instance, we have this blue-green factor uh, guidelines that we prepared for water treatment, i.e. climate adaptation, um, and green, uh, green, uh, securing green um, environments as well. The city tells what type of coefficient or standard, but a developer and their architects can show us how they actually want to implement it um, and secure that quality. When it comes to the individual building projects themselves, I think that um, it's very important to read the setting and the context. And that perhaps that's one of the things we changed most in our ways of working. 
Environmental impact analyses are very important, but even more so are what I call premise analysis or um, place and feasibility studies. Um, if you have place and feasibility studies with public space framework plans, we use more and more energy on that. That gives the basis for planning obligations or urban contracts for sharing both the planning value that the plan is creating, but also the cost of building it. So the developers have to pay for these different public spaces that we created, <coughs> a very important aspect in our practice. Another aspect I would like to uh, mention is uh, the reuse and retrofit uh, of existing buildings. Uh, and then I don't talk about classical conservation, but about um, uh, re reduce climate gas emission, where both whole buildings should be remodeled, building components should be designed for demantling, and building materials should be recirculated. Recir Here is one remodel building, an old battery factory. However, this new approach to reusing existing structures uh, requires both legal and professional renewal. The building codes are designed for new products only uh, and should open up for more experimental solutions, as um, Alfredo mentioned. Conservation officers and practice should open up for bigger changes than traditionally has been the case. To the left, you see in the background an office block being turned into housing through putting on a layer of balconies around the building. And to the right, Teresa's got the where an, quite an extensive on-field project has actually been accepted by the historic monuments officers. Let me repeat my three major action points to, in order to balance different interests. We need to change planning law and concept cost analysis methods to make democratic planning processes legally binding to the latter. We need to start with area-based space and feasibility studies with public petition, um, public participation as obligatory programming <coughs> tool. I think that's very important. And thirdly, for great reuse of existing buildings and building components, building codes and conservation practices need to be renewed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elna Vibe. So now we are going to have a little um, a change of scene. Uh, we are now opening up for the... <clears throat> um, uh, well, uh, I'm going to put this another way. Uh, we will invite now all the speakers uh, to bring forward their action points that they have prepared for uh, as an input to Habitat Norway's uh, 10 points of action. Now that you have the inspirational three as a start here, that could be like a mind, uh, put your mind to it, way of thinking. Uh, because of the COVID-19, we will have to have uh, organized it in this way that I will move. I can move. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then I will invite uh, uh, first, uh, Gro and uh, uh, Victoria and uh, Tove up to um, to present your points. And when they are ready, I will invite uh, the re Ellen and also and Alfonso uh, up. And uh, these contributions uh, will be inspiration for the ones that are following in the here in the room or on the Utah, YouTube uh, streaming. You can also write in uh, on the chat, on the uh, email and on the Facebook event uh, input to our uh, 10 points of action. So let's see how this work. I will go over there. Okay. Uh-huh. 
Thing, Tura and myself. Um, okay, so we have um, two main action points uh, learning from Helsult. Uh, number one is to find and nurture the existing qualities um, of a place. And number two is um, how we talk about it makes a difference. Um, the self image of a place shapes its physical environment. Um, our experience, do you want to comment as well? Or do I just just short. Of? Yeah, it's okay. good. It's I fine. Can, Call. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 sorry. No, a short comment, please. Short comment. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, sorry. <laughs> All right. Communication is um, difficult. Well, we just uh, realized, uh, in particular with the case of the Snöta or the Grand Hotel, that uh, how we talk about it matters a lot in how uh, the community sees it and in that, uh, in relation to that, how um, how they, well, whatever. I uh, lost the track. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Okay. Uh, I, uh, we have been talking already, Eric and I, but uh, I think I would try to just uh, hang on to what you are saying because how we talk about things is important. And that means that uh, in school curricula, from primary to college and university, it's, it's necessary to encourage the understanding of architecture and place, a community space, as a tool to strengthen the experience of belonging, promoting aesthetical and ethical values and dimensions among pupils and students. So we need another way of teaching, another way of learning, not only a learning connected to our consciousness, but to being people with our bodies being here. <laughs> so that is what I find most important. And that is, of course, important also for uh, architectural students. It's, it's uh, crucial for architectural students, understanding that we are here. And uh, uh, qualities is connected to our senses and bodies. And architectural qualities, discussing that uh, is connected to how we experience uh, rooms and conditions. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, um, Johannes, I have to ask you, uh, is there any question, comments, uh, ideas, suggestions on the chat, mm. email? No. No. Not, not that no. The, uh, there's, there's still some from, from, uh, from the people entering the stage. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. I think that... Okay, I think we'll... Uh, yes, I think we will then continue. Uh, thank you very much for coming up and for your suggestion. Um, so, uh, Ellen and Alfonso, and uh, I, make, I mix up the Alfonso and the... Sorry. Uh, my goodness. Alfredo, sorry, sorry. Uh, please come up and give your points. I see that Ellen has uh, some uh, uh, added comment to the three to the three suggestions that you left with. Well, I've had a uh, uh, opportunity to state those three, but <laughs> uh, amongst the ten that is that are given here, I think it's interesting that a lot of it uh, talks about public space and the public realm. And then, in addition, it talks about how people are allowed to participate and develop and use them in, in sort of socio-economic and um, environmentally friendly man manners. I think the point five, um, shall I read it? Do you want me to read it? Yeah, read it. Yes. Um, is perhaps the one, if I have to choose, I don't find it easy to choose. Public space and buildings and nature that surround and define it need to be socially, economically, environmentally sustainable. Social sustainability requires secure the security, equity and justice. Economic sustainability benefits from affordable capital and operating budgets. The local economy needs to be seen in relation to a globalized economy. 
environmental sustainability addresses ecological issues and health. We need to encourage an architecture and urban design that is adaptable, appreciated and cared for. It is then sustained for a longer time. Area-based space and feasibility studies with participation as obligatory programming tools should be promoted. A bit of that was in the print. Thank you. Then we have some priority, uh, priority, prioritization. Yeah. Sorry. Please. Thanks. Uh, oh, sorry. Well, a um, couple of points that more towards uh, the way we work. Mm. So it's first get the community, which is the client, involved in the entire process from this first sketch to the final decoration of the building. So it creates a sense of ownership. And use local knowledge and not just in our case architects, but also sociologists, industrial designers, interior designers, builder, builders, any, anybody that wants and is willing to help and get them involved from the start. Also here locally, for example, we also get involved with engineers without borders who give us also the support for free to develop this project. So we have to open our doors to knowledge, to all type of knowledge that are, it's willing to just help a little bit to give it these projects off the ground. Thank you very much. And now the last one, please, okay. Lafosse. Um, yeah, maybe one little preamble. Um, a lot of you don't remember, but when the exposition of uh, Arts Décoratif in Paris was opened in the turn of the century, uh, 20th century, um, uh, just at the turn, uh, Le Corbusier had a pavilion there called the Pavilion of Esprit Nouveau. Now, that was also next to a lot of uh, propositions of, of, of uh, classical architecture pavilions that were all around. And his uh, was said to look like an ice box, right? His building was said, it was a little cube as a pavilion, a spring nouveau. And so they decided to put a wall around it to show, to, to, to kind of uh, tell the public it's not finished, it has no decoration yet. And so they covered the pavilion in a wall. Um, and I say this is because the shock of the new is always t uh, uh, a very um, aggressive, let's say, to a general public. But we must understand that styles like Queen Anne style, uh, Art Deco style only lasted for five, ten years. So styles go in and out of fashion. We cannot let architecture be run by fashion, but we can let architecture, urbanism, and the construction of a city be led by ideas concepts um, that w which in the case of Le Corbusier, he called the new spirit. So yes, we do have to look for these new spirits. So if I were to summarize my, my points, I would say don't follow courses of diplomacy, right? Um, <laughs> informality or participation is the new normality. We don't acquire a culture of comfort. Uh, what we need is uh, more ethics and less aesthetics. Confront urban problems, right? We refuse to develop a new vocabulary. Call things by their real names. Stop talking in circles and squares, in shapes, forms. That's nostalgic. Um, we can't remain indifferent to the climate of lies that are happening in our cities. Um, ignoring reality makes the world unfair, as you know from Black Lives Matter. We must contribute to attack fallacies, holding those responsible, accountable. And until we do that, the architect, the urbanist, the planner will not regain a position in society. And if you think back to the Renaissance, Alberti, Raphael, Vitruvius, Brunelleschi, Michelangelo were at the top let me, da Vinci were at the top level of society. They were right next to the politicians who made decisions. So for some reason, architects are not being paid attention to. So our profession is increasingly engaging in social change. 
opposing indifference, confronting inequality, injustice with the power of design. That's the point. Do not sub-edit design. Design is at the heart of everything. Thank you. Thank you very much, <laughs> very much, uh, Alfredo Brianburg and uh, all the rest of you. Uh, I think that this one point that you made um, can be a very <laughs> nice conclusion. Uh, we in Habitat Norway are very, very uh, pleased to have uh, gotten so many um, feedbacks on the 10 points of uh, action. I'm sure that it will now improve improve and be much more forceful uh, and uh, for that I think that it's the end of the seminar and the purple will sing a song as a goodbye <laughs> yes, thank you very much for attending thank you very much um, it's uh, it has stayed a secret uh, throughout the entire seminar but uh, I can come out and say that I'm also a board member of Habitat Norway, <laughs> uh, and I urge you all to, to become members. It's a, very, it's a wonderful organization, and you can follow us on our web pages and uh, <laughs> yeah, follow our, our activities. Um, and I'd also like to introduce uh, the band members. Uh, on my left, um, tuning his guitar, uh, as usual, uh, Sindre Deschington. Uh, on bass, Thomas Clausen, and on lead guitar, Ivan Knappi. Uh, my name is uh, Eilert Ellefsen, and uh, this last song is called Karikatur. Som jeg besøkte biblioteket en gang Kastet mig over kvinner Som jeg kastet mig over bøker en gang Men for ordet var for langt oh. Mitt engasjement saboterer Bekjente ble fremmede for mig, Men fremmede ville kjenne mig, Ville bekjente ikke lenger kjennes av mig. Min skygge forlot mig oh. Thank you all.